Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We'll be looking at Exodus chapter 22 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a copy of the Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 22. We'll be there in just a moment. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, feel free to do that on the YouTube video. If you have something else that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send me a text or give a phone call to me at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They have received the Ten Commandments at the base of Mount Sinai. They're now in the process of receiving the rest of God's law through the prophet Moses. And so tonight we continue with some finer details, we might say, in the law of Moses. And we start tonight with the opening paragraph, Exodus 22, verses 1 through 6. And I don't know about yours, but my copy of the Bible puts this under the heading of property rights. So the, the laws here are somewhat random, but at least in the first half of this chapter, they pretty much fall under that heading of property rights. So Exodus chapter 22, and let's look at verses 1 through 6. Exodus 22, 1 through 6. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account, he shall surely make restitution. If he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. If a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes so that stacked grain or the standing grain or the field itself is consumed, he who started the fire shall surely make restitution. Well, up in verse 1, we have the penalty for stealing as paying back five times as much for oxen, four times as much for sheep. And the first thing that comes to my mind here is Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Remember that? The wee little man who had to climb a tree to see Jesus, and then Jesus invites himself into this man's home for a meal. And Zacchaeus concluded as a result of that encounter that he would pay back four times as much to anyone he had defrauded in his tax collecting. So that was his repentance. And of course, in response, Jesus says that salvation has come to this house. And that's the famous passage right after that, where Jesus says that he has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so here at the beginning, we just want to note that the penalty for stealing was more than simply repaying what was stolen, but it was actually a penalty. So there was some restitution, and then there was also a penalty on top of that. So if you stole something, you couldn't just give it back and say, oh, my bad, I'm sorry, here it is. Uh, but there was actually uh, a restitution involved above and beyond that, kind of a penalty of either four or five times what you stole. So that would hopefully be a deterrent. You, you couldn't just say, oops, and then move on. In verse 2, as I understand this, God seems to be allowing a homeowner to kill in defense of his property, if I understand this correctly. If a thief breaks in at night in particular, if a thief is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness. So, of course, we know bad things happen at night, and you don't know whether this person is in your home, uh, especially at night, if he intends you harm. I would kind of tend to, uh, to assume the worst if somebody's in my house and they shouldn't be, especially in the dark. Uh, but notice in this passage, if it happens once the sun comes up, uh, then the property owner will be held accountable. So, you know, if you have another take on this, let me know, but the translations that I checked were fairly similar on this. Uh, and even in the self-defense and the active shooter type classes that I've had, um, even the cops who've taught those classes have emphasized this. If somebody breaks into your home, you kind of need to assume that they intend harm. They're not there to just pay a social visit. And you probably have a right to respond with lethal force, but you also need to process Am I in danger physically? Is my life in danger? Is my family in danger? Or is just my stuff in danger? And that's a lot to contemplate, and so it's kind of something you need to figure out ahead of time. And is what you do next justified legally, uh, but also can you live with it morally and emotionally? 
And so there's a lot going on in a situation like that, and it seems that this is addressed here, at least with this difference uh, between whether the break-in happens at night or in the daylight. At night, you kind of assume the worst, and you take care of things. In the daytime, um, there is more caution advised here. At least that's the way I would take this passage under the law of Moses. Not that we're under that today. I'm just saying that's what it seems to be back then. Well, if the thief survives the encounter, though, uh, he must make restitution. And if he has nothing to make restitution with, then the thief can be sold. And this is something I don't think we really took into account as to the origin of slavery in last week's study. I know we talked about a little bit of that. Uh, but last week we noted that slaves in ancient Israel were not to be kidnapped uh, since God gave the death penalty as the penalty for kidnapping. And so we said that somebody might sell themselves into slavery, something closer to indentured servitude, as uh, we may be familiar with in American history and some of the colonies early on. Uh, people would get themselves into financial trouble, and they could sell themselves into slavery. So maybe something like that. However, notice here we find another possibility. Instead of being sent to prison, which would be hard to do in the wilderness, a thief could actually be sold to pay off his debt of restitution, and certainly that would be some kind of deterrent. Well, in verse 4, if what he stole is still alive, whether it's an ox, a donkey, or a sheep, he must pay double, because he's actually giving back the original animal. Well, in verse 5, we have landowners being held accountable for property, uh, for properly managing their animals as they graze. And so if their animals are allowed to strip their own land bare, which really shouldn't be done, and if they do that and then they head over to another man's field to strip it, the landowner is responsible. And the landowner has to make restitution from the best of his own land. Uh, one of the commentaries was making the point that restitution should lean toward the side of quality and generosity. So your sheep didn't necessarily eat the best of that guy's land, but in order to make it right, you need to go above and beyond and give him the best of your land in return. And I would just point out here briefly that God recognizes personal property rights, the personal ownership of land. Their land was not communal, uh, but each person had land that they owned that they were responsible for managing. And that, of course, goes back to the Garden of Eden. They had to manage the land. That was one of the uh, jobs given to Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, under the law of Moses, they could farm it. They could raise animals on it. They could grow crops on it. They could make a profit. They could buy. They could sell. But notice here, they could not abuse someone else's land in the process. So they had to be very careful that they only dealt with their own. And then in verse 6, if someone starts a fire that gets out of control, that person is then financially responsible for the damage that that fire causes. Whether it's standing grain in a field that's damaged, so grain that's ready to be harvested, you know, or whether it's the field itself, something else burns down, you know, anyone who starts a fire needs to be extremely careful not to let that fire get out of control. And uh, notice the uh, reference here to thorns. I think some may say thorns or thistles. Um, one of the commentaries was saying that they would often plant thorns along the hedgerows. And so this may be a reference almost to an ancient version of a fence. Um, but in a sense, being careful with fire, that's really a part of loving your neighbor, isn't it? Of course, we talked with the Ten Commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, kind of that division, the first four and the following six. Well, this would fall under that category, I think, of loving your neighbor, keeping your fires under control. So under the law of Moses, when I go start a fire, I need to keep this in mind. I need to be aware of my neighbors, and that's a pretty good principle even to keep in mind today. And of course, not that we're ruled by this law, but I'm just saying a general principle here. And of course, we have similar rules or laws or city ordinances today. Uh, in the city of Madison, for example, a backyard fire pit, uh, technically, according to city ordinance, needs to be 15 feet from the property line. It needs to be 15 feet from anything combustible, like a house or a tree or a fence, and the homeowner has to have a UL-listed fire pit with a spark arrestor and a charged water hose nearby. Those are the literal rules for having a, like a fire pit or a campfire inside the city of Madison. And then on top of that, the fire cannot be smoky. And so the rule is here in Madison, if a neighbor complains about your smoky fire, if you're burning wet wood, and the neighbor whines or is concerned and calls 911, the fire department, they can come put it out and they can send you the bill for putting it out. So it, it's not exactly the same, but I'm just saying that we have rules today that are at least somewhat similar to what they had back in ancient Israel. Be careful with the fires that you burn, that they don't get out of control and hurt your neighbor. Uh, and before we move on, I would also point out that these laws are somewhat hopeful. 
uh, that these laws point to the future uh, in that the people have no land at this point. I mean, they're in the middle of nowhere at the base of this mountain. They don't have crops and land and fences and and sheep and goats and oxen and all that kind of thing. They're, they're just runaway slaves standing around a mountain in the middle of nowhere. But God foresees a time when they will have a land of their own. And so in that sense, the law is hopeful. Um, they're, they're being given laws that may not apply to them immediately, but they will hopefully in the very near future. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 22, verses 7 through 9, the next paragraph. Exodus 22, 7 through 9. If a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him, and it is stolen from the man's house, if the thief is caught, he shall pay double. If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. For every breach of trust, whether it is for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the judges. He whom the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. And this is quite the interesting provision in the law. I mean, this passage recognizes that sometimes people lie. Isn't that what's going on here? In verse 7, we have a neighbor giving something to his neighbor to watch over for a little while. And if that something goes missing, we have several possibilities. First of all, the thief, the guy who stole it, may get caught. And if so, the thief has to pay back double. However, on the other hand, if something goes missing that you've given your neighbor to take care of and the thief is not caught, well, then the guy who owns the stuff might be wondering, did my stuff really get stolen in some random burglary? Or did my neighbor take my stuff, even though I gave it to him to watch over? And so the stuff is missing or lost. And in that case, the law says that both parties then have to come before the judges. And the judges are given the responsibility of sorting this thing out. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in this, in that judges have a way of getting to the truth uh, in a way that their skill in doing that often goes beyond, I think, what most of us are able to do. I've said before that at our youth camp, when two little boys get into it with each other, that's a problem when 60 or 70 kids get together in the woods for a week, it happens. And I hate that. Um, I hate trying to figure out who did what to whom and who did it first and who needs to have some kind of a consequence, or maybe they both do. Who knows what happened? Uh, you know, however, I've also mentioned that we've had a county jailer on staff for a number of years, and that guy is like the human lie detector. He is calm. He sits down with the two separately. He asks some good questions. He, he writes it down. He takes notes. He, he checks with one guy, then the other guy, then back to the first guy. He may check with witnesses. And then he comes to a conclusion. And he sits them down together. This is what it sounds like happened. And this is what needs to happen going forward. It's a beautiful thing to watch that. His skill in resolving conflict and, and solving who's lying, who's telling the truth is just amazing. It is a beautiful thing to behold. And it wears me out. I just, I can't do that. I delegate that to people who are better at that than I am. But personally, I think that's what's going on here. Instead of one guy's stuff going missing and him going vigilante on the other, the law of Moses has these tough cases get sent up to the judges, and the judges get to figure that out. And so God then, I think, anticipates this, even though these people have only been on their own in the wilderness for about three months now. Hopefully they haven't had too many actual uh, fights or disputes like that, but obviously they had a lot because Moses was dealing with that when Jethro comes along. So anyway, God foresees this, and he gives some rules for it. Well, let's continue with Exodus 22, verses 10 through 15, the next paragraph. Exodus 22, 10 through 15. If a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep for him, and it dies or is hurt or is driven away while no one is looking, an oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid hands on his neighbor's property, and its owner shall accept it, and he shall not make restitution. But if it is actually stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is all torn to pieces, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn to pieces. If a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while its owner is not with it, he shall make full restitution. 
If his owner is with it, he shall not make restitution. If it is hired, it came for its hire. In this passage, we have, I think, a slight twist on what we saw in the previous passage. It's a tough case, but it's similar. Only instead of money or goods, now we're dealing with animals. And animals obviously bring a little bit more complexity to a situation. Not only might an animal get stolen, but we also, I think, realize that an animal might die or might get hurt or maybe driven away. An animal might run away when no one's looking. You know, animals have legs of their own. And so it's a bit more complicated than the previous paragraph where we were dealing with some items. But similar rules are given here. The guy who is taking care of the animals has to make an oath before the Lord that he didn't do it. But if the animal was stolen, he has to pay for it. If the animal was attacked by a wild animal, he brings the pieces as evidence, and really it's not his problem because these things happen. And that's interesting to me. In verse 14, we have yet another twist. Instead of one man giving another man something to take care of for a short time, we have one man borrowing something from his neighbor. So it's like the other direction. And in that case, the burden shifts to the one who borrows. If whatever it is gets injured or dies, the one who borrowed it must make restitution because he's the one who asked for it unless the owner is with it. Unless it was kind of a package deal, then that guy would be uh, responsible. Um, but at the end, it looks like the law addresses uh, now the renting or the, the hiring of an animal. Uh, my understanding is that any loss here falls on the owner because that's a risk he took in renting out his animals to somebody. That kind of, you're in this for a profit, and you've been making a profit doing this, and this is a risk of business, therefore uh, this situation is on you if you've actually hired out this animal as opposed to uh, lending it or having somebody take care of it for you when you're out of town. Well, let's continue with Exodus 22, 16 through 20, and kind of get some random stuff going on here. Uh, Exodus 22, 16 through 20. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. You shall not allow a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. He who sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall utterly shall be utterly destroyed. Well, again, just reading over these quickly, these, these are pretty random, aren't they? I mean, it, I don't see the connection upon the first reading. I mean, first of all, in verses 16 and 17, we've got a man seducing a virgin. And this doesn't appear to be by force, as we saw in our lesson this past Lord's Day with, I think, Amnon and what he did to Tamar. Uh, but this seems to be a guy falling in love and lying or sleeping with a young woman before they're married. And in that case, they are to get married with the man paying a dowry to her family, as he should have done in the first place. So it's a little bit of out of order here. However, notice that if the dad says no, the young man still has to pay the dowry. And that's interesting. The dad may know best. The dad may take some advice from his daughter. No way, I'm not going with this guy, that kind of thing. We're not told that here. Uh, but if the dad says no to this relationship, the man still has to pay up. And that, that's interesting. Um, you know, and I think if he refuses and word gets out that his daughter is not a virgin, she may have a hard time getting married back in that culture. And so the payment of the dowry then seems appropriate. And uh, that's, that's about all we have about this right here. I think we're going to get to more of this as the law continues to be revealed. The second instruction in this chunk seems completely unrelated. You shall not allow a sorceress to live. Okay, so no mention of the male equivalent of a sorceress. I'm not exactly sure what that would be, a, a wizard or, or something. Uh, but this is all we have. Any kind of sorcery or uh, magic or communicating with the dead, I don't know. All, all that seems to fall under that category. And it was condemned under the law of Moses. And this is simply the first reference to it. More is referenced elsewhere. But for now, sorceresses are not allowed to live. Uh, in verse 19, we have another seemingly unre unrelated issue. Anyone who practices bestiality, that is anyone who lies with an animal, is to be put to death. And again, how in the world does that fit in here? We're not told quite yet. Uh, but notice in verse 20, anyone who sacrifices to any God other than to the Lord alone shall be completely destroyed. And as I said, these seem to be unrelated to us at least. But we also need to remember that these people were coming from the land of Egypt, where they had seen a whole lot of weird stuff through the years. They had seen some bizarre things down there. 
and they'd been influenced by that. Certainly they had. And they were also heading toward the land of Canaan, where they would see even more bizarre things in the future. And so the common thread between all these things that we just read through may be that God is preparing them for what's coming. And he's giving them the warning ahead of time. Do not let the weird stuff that you'll be seeing affect you. Because you're heading into some strange places. You're going to be traveling through the wilderness. You're going to see some strange stuff out there. And you are not to be pulled aside by that. And that may explain some of the uh, randomness of that particular paragraph. And we'll see more of that going forward, I think, with more explanation. All right, let's continue with Exodus 22, verses 21 through 27. The next paragraph, Exodus 22, 21 through 27. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless." If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets, for that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious." In the first half of this passage, God very clearly condemns wrongdoing or oppressing a stranger. A stranger is somebody they didn't know, uh, somebody who was not an Israelite. Uh, so also they are forbidden from afflicting any widows or any orphans. And the reason people may be take, uh, tempted to take advantage of strangers and widows and orphans is probably because they seem to be pretty defenseless. You know, I can pick on these people, I can take advantage of these people because they're powerless. They can't defend themselves. You know, therefore, I can get away with it. That's the temptation. I'm, I'm picking on weak people. Uh, some people do that. However, notice how God says that he will retaliate. They may not be able to defend themselves, but God says, I am able to defend them. So when people harass the strangers and the widows and the fatherless, he hears their cries. And he gets angry at that. And he's going to lash out with the sword. And then the tables are going to be turned. Your wives will become widows and your children will become fatherless. Your people will then be in their situation. Now, in the New Covenant, we have to go a bit beyond this, don't we? It's not enough just not to kick somebody. We actually have to help people in those situations. So not only must we avoid oppressing strangers and widows and orphans, but we must actually love those who have no power to pay us back. Jesus said so much about that. We have to care for people actually doing something for those in these desperate situations. And I want to point out, as we're on this passage, this applies to us personally. You know, this passage is addressed to a nation. This is a law given to a nation. Today, however, I cannot have a politician take your money by force and do this for me and think that I have fulfilled my obligation. I can't say, I've checked that box, I've... I voted for this guy who says he's going to do this thing, and therefore I'm covered. I can't get away with that. Instead, I personally have to take care of the widows. I personally have to take care of the orphans and the strangers, you know, with my own finances. And obviously, Jesus has quite a bit to say about this. I mean, we could spend several weeks discussing our attitude, our actions toward the poor. Uh, under the new covenant, we are to treat people just as we ourselves would like to be treated. That The golden rule seems to summarize pretty much all of it there. Uh, but I'm just saying this is something that we do uh, as Christians, as a congregation, just as we did for Schultz Lewis over the past month or so. Uh, um, this is something that, that we are involved in doing. The second half of this passage addresses loaning money and the charging of interest. And notice, loaning is optional. You don't have to loan money. However, when it comes to loaning money to the poor, if that's what you're going to do, God forbids charging interest. I remember my grandfather telling me that the fastest way to lose a friend is to loan him money. <laughs> the fastest way to lose a friend is to loan him money. And he referred back to his days in the Navy when, I, when he loaned somebody some small amount of money, like two or three bucks. And it just ruined the relationship because the guy didn't pay him back. And it wasn't a huge loss. But for the next 60 years, whenever he thought of that man, what did he think about? 
oh, that's the guy. <laughs> he owes me $2 or whatever. So I'm just saying that loaning under the law of Moses was optional. But when they did loan the money to the poor, it was to be interest-free. That The interest part of it, at least, was to be considered a gift. So if you want to do it, great, you can do it. Uh, but don't be charging interest to the poor. And the other aspect of this was that if they ever took their neighbor's cloak for a pledge, they had to give it back every night. And the reason is, if you had to take his coat as a pledge, it's probably all that he has. So how is he going to keep warm at night? And God sees that. In my mind, God is hearing this desperate prayer for warmth from this guy over here. And this other guy over here has the first guy's coat tossed on the back of a chair doing nothing. And that's not right. You know, one guy is rich, obviously has money to lend, and so he's got a coat of his own. And this other guy is cold. And God sees that, and that's not okay in the eyes of God. God will take care of that. So here's a thought question for us. Obviously, we are not under the law of Moses tonight. Uh, most of us have probably never taken anybody's coat for a pledge for a loan. Have you ever done that? I've never done that. I've never taken somebody's coat from them as, as a pledge for a loan. However, do any of us have any extra coats laying around? Do you have any coats in your closet that you're not using? If so, I think we can imagine that God would want us to give those away. Does that make sense? I'm just picturing a closet full of coats while people all around us are cold. And that's not good. And obviously we do a clothing giveaway program here at our congregation, but certainly this is something we can do personally as well. Um, years ago, I preached a gospel meeting down in Tennessee and we flew down there in August and my wife only brought long sleeves, you know, we, we were up here, it's not hot in Wisconsin, so we go down there dressed like we might up here, and as we left the gospel meeting one night, it was like Sunday night, or it was like the first or maybe the second night of the meeting, uh, we were the last ones to leave, it was dark, we were behind the church building about to get in our car, and an elder's wife saw that situation. She saw that my wife was miserable in her long sleeve clothing. And this elder's wife took off her own shirt that night and gave it to my wife right there in the parking lot so that she could have something more comfortable to wear the following day. That woman literally gave us the shirt off her back right there uh, behind the church building. And I'm just saying that seems to be the spirit that is carried over into the New Testament. Of course, here it's a law given to a nation and it's against charging interest and keeping the guy's cloak. But I'm saying the bigger picture under the New Covenant is if you have the power to help somebody, uh, we need to be helping people in any way that we can. So I thought I'd share that before we move on. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus chapter 22, verses 28 through 31. Exodus 22 verses 28 through 31. You shall not curse God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay the offering from your harvest and your vintage. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be holy men to me, therefore you shall not eat any flesh torn to pieces in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. In verse 28, <clears throat> notice they are not to curse God, nor to curse a ruler of their people. You may remember this was quoted by Paul when he unknowingly insulted the high priest in Acts 23, verses 4 and 5. So Paul was very much aware of this passage, and apparently he violated it without knowing it and apologized for it. <clears throat> In verses 29 and 30, offerings were not to be delayed. This is strange because we haven't really had too much information about the actual offerings quite yet, but this comes first. When you have to give an offering, don't put it off. And this includes your firstborn, who were to be dedicated to the Lord in some way. We don't have the details, that's coming. But the same goes for animal offerings. No procrastination when it comes to giving your offering to the Lord. And then the last verse, they are not to eat any animals that have been torn to pieces in the field. Today we understand this, don't we? If you're out hunting somewhere and you find a deer that's been ripped to pieces in the field, do you rejoice and cancel your hunt and drag that carcass back home and say, hey, hey, we got food? You know, I don't think that's how that happens. If you didn't see it die, you have no idea what's going on there. 
you know, what caused the death of this creature? What's happening in terms of bacteria and who knows what else? And I think some of these laws were probably intended simply to keep the people safe and alive as a nation until the arrival of the Messiah. So there were a lot of rules coming here in the future uh, that, that'll be along those lines. Just kind of common sense to us, like the, uh, the prohibition on pork. You know, they're in the wilderness. They don't have the meat thermometer. And there are some dangerous critters living inside some of the food that we may eat. And so he says, eat this and not this. And uh, he's giving some rules to uh, kind of keep them uh, pure through the years. Well, that brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 22 tonight. We've continued looking at the details of the law of Moses. And we hope to get back to this next week. We'll jump right back into it. But thank you so much for being with us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help as a church, uh, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We want to hear from you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the eternal God, and tonight we're so thankful for your law as it was revealed to your people through the prophet Moses. We're thankful for the lessons that we've learned tonight, both from the old and from the new. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, for showing us a new and a better way. Tonight we ask for wisdom as we care for those in need. We pray for open eyes and willing hearts, eyes open to the suffering that we see around us and hearts that are willing to do something to alleviate that suffering. We pray for further blessings so that we can pass along those blessings to others. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.